I like this as a starting map. Um, if you look at it for a minute, you'll recognize the boroughs of New York City, or if you read the text on it, you'll recognize that these are the boroughs of New York City. Um, and so the question is, you know, like why did the cartographer in this case choose to put these different states, you know, on top of the boroughs of New York City? And I think this is pretty cool because it's basically just trying to give a sense of comparability of population size, right? So the entirety of New Mexico, of Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, and Maine, and all of those populations in, you know, in some cases, some pretty sizable states out there, you know, all fits within New York City. So, um, you know, pretty interesting thinking about size of places in terms of area versus size of places in terms of population. So what I want to talk about today is habitat modeling. So we saw this map um, a few weeks ago, the habitat suitability for the California gnat catcher. And it's likely that if you haven't already seen sort of maps that are similar to this, that you will at some point see some sort of map like this, which is you know, basically, okay, here are some areas that are really good for this species, here are areas that are not so good for this species. Um, and people create these types of habitat suitability models for, you know, a variety of different purposes. So, for example, if you're interested in a rare or endangered species, right, and you're trying to, you know, identify areas that should be preserved, um, to the extent that that's possible or, you know, trying to prevent development in, um, you know, priority habitat areas, then having some sort of information about the hab suitable habitat for that species becomes really important, right? Um, another example of that uh, reasons why people make these kind of habitat models um, is for invasive species, which is one of the things that I study. So, for example, maybe you want to know, is this invasive species likely to come to Massachusetts or come to my neighborhood? Um, you know, how proactive should I be about keeping an eye out for it, trying to eradicate it early? Um, or do I not really need to worry about it too much? Because, you know, even if one or two established, uh, it's unlikely to spread to this region. Um, so the question that we want to talk about today is basically how do people create these things, right? These are maps, so fundamentally they rely on spatial analysis um, and GIS technology. So I want to go through kind of the two main pathways that habitat suitability models get created. Um, so here's another example of a habitat model. This is from a report by the USGS for the desert tortoise, which is a rare species down in the southwest. So um, this is, you know, Nevada, Arizona, Southern California area. And you'll notice on here, so in uh, lab six, a lot of what you did in terms of the raster analysis was creating these kind of binary yes, no answers, right? True, false, one is true, zero is false. Um, and so you get um, kind of an answer where it's like, here are all the areas that are suitable and everything else is not suitable. But you notice in both the gnat catcher map um, as well as the tortoise map that in these cases they have this gradation of high suitability to low suitability, right? So just thinking along those terms that, you know, just a simple yes, no answer might not be what people, you know, want ultimately in, in habitat suitability. They might want, you know, best, uh, you know, better, okay, and bad in the case of the example on the right, right? So um, binary maps typically get made with and statements, the Boolean and statements, or by multiplying different layers together, right? Where you say only the areas where everything is one, um, those are the only areas where I end up with, you know, the answer being true, that this is a suitable location. Um, on the other hand, we have these examples of ones that are rather than an, a Boolean and statement with a Boolean or statement um, or with simple addition, basically. So you have a bunch of one, one zero layers to begin with and you're saying uh, the habitat gets better as you add these things together, as you have these different criteria, 
um, but none of them, you know, is an absolute no-go if you end up with a zero. Um, and so in that case, you end up with this sort of four total categories, zero, one, two, and three, rather than the zero and one on the left-hand side. Um, and of course, you could combine these things, you know, I mean, if you're talking about, for example, you know, a riparian species, it has to be around wetlands, but then other criteria like the slope or the soils or the tree cover are kind of, you know, like, they, they, there's a gradient in there, like it, none of those is going to exclude it. So let's say you have a wetland species that tends to like, you know, forested systems in, you know, uh, silty soils on gentle slopes, right? Um, you could say, I'm going to have a binary one zero absolute, you know, like if it's outside of a riparian system, it's, if it's outside of a wetland, you know, it gets a zero. Uh, inside of those areas are the only ones that could actually be true. So I'm going to multiply that layer by the addition of these different ones that are, um, you know, how much tree cover does it have? You know, that might be like a zero, one, two. How much, uh, what, you know, what's the slope, you know, shallow, moderate, steep kind of thing. Also, you know, zero, one, two, same thing uh, with whatever the soil condition is types of things. So you could multiply this like must be inside of the um, must be inside of the wetland by you know a gradation of everything that's going on inside of that wetland. So you can combine these different things. All right so here are just some examples of stuff that you've already thought about and already done in some cases um, of reclassifying basically suitability, you know, from rather than thinking of it in a binary sense of only the elevations between 500 and 600 feet are suitable. Instead, we can reclassify those into ones where, you know, low values, high elevations are the worst. Um, high values, lower elevations are the best, and, you know, everything in between those gets different gradients of values. So be thinking about that along those terms um, if you're using a raster analysis for some sort of suitability analysis for final projects, because it doesn't just have to be a single one uh, answer of where that critter can be. It can be a gradient of, of suitability. All right. So back to the habitat modeling. So this initial question of how do we know or how did uh, this report that was, that was written about the desert tortoise, how did they create this type of model? Um, and in that model, and this, I took this from the paper, they have a lot of different information in there. So they have information about uh, the topography of the landscape, so slope, aspect, aspect is the direction that you're facing, you know, north facing versus south facing kind of thing, elevation, they had climate conditions, they had information about soil, and they had information about um, plant cover, basically. Um, and so the question is, okay, what approach approaches could they have taken to take all of this spatial data and put it into a model you know, based on something that we know about desert tortoise. So how do we know desert tortoise habitat? Well, one of the things, uh, reasons that we know stuff about desert tortoise habitat is because people have studied the desert tortoise. You know, they've watched it roaming around. They've uh, seen that it tends to burrow. So desert tortoise uh, digs these big burrows um, and it tends to burrow in a particular soil type. Um, so the soils can't be too sandy, otherwise the burrow, you know, collapses. They can't be too hard and clay, otherwise the tortoise can't dig them out. So it's sort of this like intermediate thing. We've observed tortoises eating things, so we know that they eat um, flowering plants, for example. Um, so areas where there's more of this sort of um, annual plant production are pretty good for the soils. Um, I guess I already mentioned the soil component, um, so bulk density, which is, you know, basically the density of the soil uh, is important in terms of tortoise burrows. So we can take that information, right? Um, there is not a specific um, spatial layer for 
annual forb color cover, so the flowering plant cover. Um, but there's a proxy for that that we can kind of use. Um, and there is a spatial data layer for soils um, and soil bulk density specifically. So this uh, image on the left is from satellite. We talked a little bit in the remote sensing lecture about the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, um, which can be used as sort of a proxy for greenness of vegetation. Um, and so you can you know, see across the landscape, there's a lot of topography going on in the Western US. Uh, so some areas that have a lot of vegetation productivity and some that don't have that much. Um, you can use that in terms of, okay, here are areas that, you know, produce a lot of vegetation at a particular time period. Um, and then there are these interpolated soil products um, from the USGS that include soil bulk density, which can be used as a proxy for where that tortoise can dig. So that is taking prior information and applying it using spatial data layers that act either as a direct interpretation of uh, that piece of information. So soil bulk, bulk density to soil bulk, bulk density is an example, or we have a spatial data layer that acts as a proxy. So, you know, taking annual forb co cover and using satellite um, greenness, basically vegetation productivity as a proxy for um, where that information is on the landscape one option. Another option that we can use is based on our observations, where people have actually seen desert tortoise populations, um, and relating the information about where desert tortoises have been observed to information about the landscape or the region. So this is kind of path two, right? Um, we don't necessarily know about tortoise habitat, but we've seen them around. And so based on having seen them in places, we can use that information to try to infer what their habitat is like. Um, and we can take that information and there's kind of an important piece here, which is that not only do we wanna know whether where the desert tortoise is, we'd also like to know where the desert tortoise isn't, you know, like it hasn't been observed in these other locations. and so that we can compare the habitat you know, conditions from where it is relative to where it isn't. Because if those two things are different, then we can say, aha, okay, it prefers shallow soils because I see it in the shallow soils and I don't see it in the uh, deep soils or whatever it is, right, that you're, you're um, trying to model. This is actually a tricky piece in habitat modeling. And I say this is a little bit of an aside, but for the most part, we have decent to pretty good data about where species exist. You know, we've got occurrences for them, whether that's from museum records, herbarium records, collar data, um, you know, people taking pictures with their phones and uploading them to um, online someplace. We've got pretty good data for where species are. We don't actually have good data for where species are not. So all of these kind of hollow circles in here are actually what we would call pseudo absences. So these are areas where uh, we're just kind of creating a new data layer product using a random point generator, which you guys will do in lab seven, um, as a proxy for where things are not within this general landscape that's been observed. Okay, so for argument's sake, now we have a presence, we have a bunch of presences, we have a bunch of pseudo absences. We can take these data points and combine them with spatial data layers that we think might be relevant for the desert tortoise. So for example, if we wanted to know something about slope, we wanted to know something about elevation, does the tortoise tend to prefer shallow slopes and low elevations or vice versa, then we can take that data Basically, you're gonna do this in lab seven, extract information to all of those points so that we can build some information about, you know, what's the average, what's the variance on typical elevation ranges where the desert tortoise exists? Um, what is, what do those uh, averages and ranges look like for where the desert tortoise 
does not exist and are those significantly different so basically going back to your you know t-tests from um from stats stats classes that you've taken right so ultimately those were kind of our two paths to getting to this type of model those are not mutually exclusive paths maybe you have some information about soil bulk density that you can apply spatially because a study has been done on tortoise habitat but you don't know anything about topography aspect slope elevation and so you want to derive that from occurrences of where the tortoise has been observed combine those two at the end to get uh, you know gradients of habitat suitability so recap on this two big options in terms of doing habitat modeling one is that you define whatever suitability is based on prior knowledge based on expert opinion based on studies that have been done um, in the literature Option two is that you define suitable habitat based on spatial relationships. So that is, you know, you, or you find some occurrence data for, for the species of interest. Um, you have or you create some of these pseudo absence points to compare it to, and you test whether there seems to be a preference for, you know, this particular elevation whatever the spatial data layer is that you're interested in doing. Okay, so um, in the next set of slides, I'm going to go specifically through um, habitat modeling exercise, which there is uh, an optional kind of lab walkthrough to do this habitat modeling. So if you decide you want to go down this route, um, particularly with an example of the um, habitat modeling for invasive plants, um, then definitely take a look at the next set of slides.